Hello class, good to see you again, good to be here. Uh, wish I could see you, I guess I should say. <laughs> uh, it's another chance for us to study God's Word. Uh, I hope this week has been good for you. I hope you've been able to stay warm, stay safe. It's been pretty, pretty tough lately with the weather. So, uh, before we get started, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dearly Father, I praise you for the blessings you give to us, for being our God, being our Father. I praise you that we can come to you with our uh, thoughts and our prayers. And Lord, we thank you that we can approach your throne. Uh, pray that you continue to guide and direct us, that your will will be done in our lives, that you will lead us with your spirit and through your word. Uh, Lord, I ask you to continue to be with those who are, in the, who are in the hospital and are sick, who need your healing hand. Pray you continue to be with us as we are compassionate and look out for each other. Uh, I just want to thank you again for your son, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Philippians chapter 3. Uh, we stopped at verse 3 last week. And Paul is talking about the uh, Judaizers. And uh, Worsby wrote a little bit here about the Judaizers and, and what's going on here. And, and I wanted to read some of it. I thought uh, that it was valuable. Uh, and Worsby said this. He said, in Paul's case, the things he was living before he knew Christ seem to be very commendable, a righteous life, obedience to the law, and defense of the religion of his fathers. And we're going to see that as we go through here, uh, talking about his, uh, his religious life up to the point of on the road to Damascus until he met Jesus. <clears throat> Worsby we went on, he said here, he said, Like most religious people today, Paul had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, but not enough righteousness to get him into heaven. It was not bad things that kept Paul away from Jesus. It was the good things. He had to lose his religion to find salvation. So that's a very thought-provoking uh, thing to say. And it has a lot of truth to it, though, in our own lives, we always have a tendency to be comfortable with the way we've always thought about things in the past. And it can be that our idea of spiritual things has been misguided. And to be able to give up on traditions, um, things that were taught to us that uh, are not scriptural, and to just follow God's word can be very hard. Uh, so I think there's a lesson here for all of us that sometimes we need to give up on some of these things that we feel very confident about and just follow God's word for what it says. Uh, so <clears throat> as we go through here, we're going to comment on this from time to time today. But uh, he, he, Worsby went on here <clears throat> and he was talking about how in the beginning... <clears throat> the gospel came to the Jew first. And that's the way God designed it. That's the way it was. But in Acts chapter 10, <clears throat> you remember Peter went to Cornelius. Now Cornelius was a Gentile. So this was the first time <clears throat> that the gospel was offered to the Gentile people. Of course, the Jewish people of the Jewish religion didn't like that especially this group of people here that, he's, that he calls Judaizers. The Judaizers felt Gentiles could become Christians, but they had to become Jews first. And so the Gentile people, the men, had to be circumcised. They had to be, become Jews first under the Mosaic Law before they could become Christians. So when uh, Peter spoke to the Gentiles, and he baptized Cornelius and his household there in Acts 10. 
They didn't like that. And so they caused trouble for Paul. And <clears throat> they went to Antioch to oppose Paul for Paul's teaching. Okay? Because remember, Paul in Acts 13, uh, on the road to Damascus, God, Jesus told Paul that he was going to be a minister to the Gentile people. So we had Peter that started it with Cornelius, made the Jews aggravated. Then we have Paul on the road to Damascus. He's, for his ministry is to the Gentile people. So these same Judaizers, they are now following Paul and causing trouble for Paul. And they went to Antioch. And it's in the 15th chapter of Acts. And they were telling the people that if you want to be a Christian... It's okay, but you have to be a Jew first. And it got to be such a contention <clears throat> that they went back to Jerusalem to the disciples, and it's uh, referred to as the council in Jerusalem, and they asked them <clears throat> this very question. <clears throat> Can someone, excuse me. <clears throat> they asked them the very question, Can someone be a Christian without being a Jew first? And the apostles that were at Jerusalem said, yes, you do not have to be circumcised, you do not have to be a Jew to be a Christian. And so, but the Judaizers were not satisfied with that. So they continued to follow Paul wherever he went and trying to take away his converts up to the point where they would, under disguise, pretend to be Christians to infiltrate the Christian churches and then try to lead people away back into Judaism. And so that is what Paul is dealing with here. And when he talks here in verse <clears throat> 2, he says, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evildoers, beware of false circumcision. That is the people that Paul is talking about. So, we're ready for verse 3 here. Verse 3 says, But we, okay, talking about true Christians, are of the true circumcision. And that we have the circumcision of Christ is really what he's talking here. Uh, and it's totally in harmony what he taught elsewhere. In Galatians 6.15 Paul wrote that neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation, a new creation is everything. Okay? Paul taught in the later letter to the Galatians that it didn't matter whether you were circumcised or not. It meant nothing as far as Christianity was concerned. Also, in second or in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, verses 11, 12, and 13. Let's read those. Colossians 2, verses 11, 12, and 13. So Paul's writing to the church at Colossae, and he, he says here, In him, talking about Jesus, in him you were also circumcised, with a circumcision not made with hands, okay? It's not the physical circumcision. It is a circumcision not made with hands. So, and he goes on here, second part of verse 11, in the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, okay? It's by removing the fleshly desires, the old thing about the uh, two-sided coin here where the flesh is on one side the spirits on the other uh, Jesus can remove this body of flesh and this this um, sentence that went with the sin that was in that so verse 12 okay this is all one sentence here so it, it's all the, tied together so it, verse 11 in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. Okay, that is where the circumcised circumcision, this coming into the family takes place. 
having been buried with him in baptism. Also, we see the picture here of being buried and then risen to walk in a newness of life that we see in other, other places in Scripture. That's what baptism is. So having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised, see there, raised with him through faith, okay? Our salvation is by baptism through faith. Remember, Bobby Warren did a nice, nice thing on that uh, on his last lesson he taught. Uh, you know, and some people say, well, your baptism can't uh, be part of salvation because it's a work. It's not a work. It is, it is, I should say it is a work, because, but it's God's work. And that's what it says right here. He says that we were raised with him through faith in the working of God. See there? God is doing the work. We are passive. We are submissive. We are being obedient. And uh, God is doing the work. It's the work of God who raised him from the dead. Now, verse 13, same idea, same word picture here. When you were dead in your transgressions, okay, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, this is before baptism, before you become a Christian, he made you alive together with him. All right? Having forgiven all of us our transgressions. It goes right along with Acts 2.38 that says, Repent and be baptized, what? For the forgiveness of your sins. And the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see how that comes into play here too in just a few verses. So Paul has taught before multiple places about this idea that circumcision is of no longer value in a religious, spiritual sense. And that it is now... This circumcision of Jesus, the circumcision of the heart, uh, being obedient. Uh, so interesting stuff, but it all goes together. And, and as you read it, you, you kind of get the idea. You know, um, I, I didn't write these verses. You know, God did. And they're there for us to look at and to learn from. And it, it all fits together. And I remember one of the things Bobby Warren said, Oh, if I can quote Bobby Warren right, if I don't, boy, look out. It's going to be trouble. Um, he said, whatever is said in Scripture might not be the whole thing, but it's, it is the true thing. In other words, there might be other things in Scripture that apply to salvation, but everything God says applies to salvation does. So you can't, you can't pick out something that's, Okay, God says this for salvation. We'll accept that. And over here, God says this for salvation. We're not going to accept that. that, that that's a pretty poor philosophy uh, to look at. So anyhow, let's go on here. Uh, so uh, we're still in verse 3. Back to Philippians 3.3. 3. Um, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. So there's three things here Christians do, those who have the true circumcision, okay? They worship in the Spirit of God. Now, I want you to know that there's two Greek words in the New Testament for worship. One uh, is, when it's translated, emphasizes submission to deity, Okay? That is worship, submission to deity. And the other word, and the word that's used here, emphasizes service done for the deity. Okay? So the word here talks about being service being done for God. So, so the, those who are, have the true circumcision are those who worship or serve God in the Spirit of God, okay? And so Christians get their directions from the Holy Spirit. Uh, we Just as we talked about, uh, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit into our hearts, uh, according to Acts 2.38, at the time of baptism. Also, they not only serve God in spirit, they glory in Christ Jesus. And the word here for glory is uh, boast or exalts in, rejoices in, Jesus being the Messiah. 
Now, that's something the Pharisees absolutely did not do. The Pharisees did not. You remember how many times Jesus called out the Pharisees and really put them in their place. They didn't like the idea that Jesus uh, called himself the Messiah. And, uh, but those who are the true circumcision do. And finally, put no confidence in the flesh. Uh, and this is uh, really speaking about being descended from Abraham. And the Pharisaic Jews, the Pharisees, these Judaizers uh, were also, the Pharisees were also part of these Judaizers. They put all this emphasis on their heritage. They were children of Abraham. Uh, but God isn't looking for folks who are of the nationality of Abraham but of the faith of Abraham. And again, if we look at other places in Scripture, we see this supported. So if we look at uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 16, it says this, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Okay? So it is uh, when God looked at Abraham, you remember, God told Abraham to look to the heavens and see the stars. So can you count the stars? He said, your descendants shall be as numerable as the stars. Um, can't count them, is what he's saying. And, of course, Abraham's thinking physical, and the Jews thought that way for a long time. But now we know through the Scripture that it's not, God wasn't talking about physical seed. He was talking about Abraham's spiritual seed. And Christians, having the faith of Abraham, are part of Abraham's seed. And so, so that's how that all fits together there. Now, we're ready for verse 4. <laughs> 15 minutes, we got through one verse. How about that? So, uh, verse 4 says, uh, I, I should say now, Paul's going to use his own example as an argument against these Judaizers. Okay? So Paul's going to say, hey, in my former life, before the road to Damascus, okay? Uh, he starts out, first phrase here, it says, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. Uh, they've, he, they were going to compare their heritage. Paul's saying, I can compare mine and my heritage is better than yours. And he's going to say why. He says, If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, flesh I far more. Okay, far more. And he's going to list seven credentials here. He's going to first talk about his inherited privileges. And then he's going to talk about his personal achievements. So, first, his herit inherited privileges. Verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day. Now, this was a main point in the Judaizers' eyes, this idea of being circumcised. And Paul's saying, I was circumcised on the eighth day. That is the commandment that God gave to Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 12. And God said, He that is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. And then it was repeated again in Leviticus 12. Uh, now, Jewish parents who were zealous for the law would see that the law was kept to the letter, and that's exactly what Paul's parents had done. So Paul's saying, I followed the law perfectly. On the eighth day, I was circumcised. And then he goes here, he says, of the nation of Israel. Now this is more specific than being a seed of Abraham. Okay, um, It's more privileged to be a descendant of Jacob. Now Jacob's name was changed to Israel. You remember in Genesis 32. And so 
it was a greater privilege to be descended from Jacob. Now, not all of Abraham's children or descendants became uh, were privileged to the promised land. Uh, none of Ishmael's kids were, and none of Esau's kids were. Okay, so, but the patriarch Jacob, later named Israel, was part of that. So God, or Paul said, not only was I part of Abraham seed, I am part of the nation of Israel. And now he goes on and he clarifies even more in other tribe of Benjamin. So to be of the tribe of Benjamin was even a more special honor. You remember, Benjamin was the only son of Israel that was born in the promised land. Uh, his mother was Rachel, who was Jacob's most beloved wife. Okay? And when the other tribes fell away, Benjamin's tri the tribe of Benjamin did not. Uh, and following the, Benj the Babylonian captivity, uh, it was people from the tribes of Benjamin and Judah that formed the northern two tribes that were good. And the other ten tribes all fell away. So it was obvious that there would have been few of these Judaizers that were uh, criticizing Paul that had all of this in their pedigree. Okay, Being son of Abraham, descendant of the nation of Israel, and of the tribe of Benjamin. That would have narrowed down, that would have wiped out a lot of them. They were hollering, they were trying to put him in his place. And he goes on here, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And the, the important thing that was here was if your parents were Hebrews and you spoke the Hebrew language, you studied the, the Old Testament law, uh, you had always been a Jew, then those, that group of people felt more privileged than those who had be Come, Jews from uh, other nationalities, and th they were part of what's called the Hellenists or the Grecian Jews that had become Jews. So he's saying, I, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Now he goes on here, um, he's going to talk about his personal attainments, the things he'd done personally. As to the law of Pharisee, now. A Sadducee was a hereditary position. You had to be born into the Sadducee's uh, system to be a Sadducee. But to become a Pharisee, it was by choice. And so you had to embrace the Pharisee's approach to the law. And they were the strictest set of the Jews. And... So before his conversion, Paul had been exceedingly zealous for the traditions that were taught by the Pharisees. So, so he's talking about his personal attributes here. Before, before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Now, verse 6. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Uh, that's evidence of his zeal. He went from city to city, putting in chains and committing to prisons both men and women. Uh, that's listed in Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul's saying, if you want to talk about being a Pharisee, I was at. You talk about persecuting the ch church, I had zeal. I did it with zeal. Now, next phrase, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. Now, Paul knows that the law could not make you blameless in God's eyes. But he's speaking hypothetically of how the Jews are looking at this. And they think that the law can make them righteous. And he says, as far as the law was concerned, I was righteous. I was found blameless. Now, the Pharisees, when they interpreted the law, uh, it was a very exacting way of looking at it. Um, if you remember, Jesus in Matthew 23 said 
that they bound rules on others which they themselves did not practice. So even though the Pharisees didn't practice all these things, they were too hard, but they still tried to bind other people to them, hold other people to them. But some of the things they did was um, knowing and being proficient in performing rituals uh, in just the right way, like dipping their hands in just uh, precisely the right way before eating. Uh, they had just exact movements to do it that they felt made them more righteous than others. And uh, Paul says, as far as all that concerned, I was blameless. Okay? But now, verse 7 starts with but. That was before he met Jesus. Now, after the road to Damascus, after Jesus told him, uh, go to Damascus and Ananias... Uh, we'll tell you what you need to do to be saved. You can read that. That's all good stuff there. Uh, but so now he says, after that, whatever things were gained to me, whatever things he thought were good that held him up, this false religious profile that Worsby was talking about earlier. Remember? People, people get this idea that such and such and such and such, whatever it is, makes them spiritual and gives them comfort that, that they are in God's graces. Uh, in reality, they might be missing what God is telling them in Scripture. And we want to be careful that we don't fall into that trap uh, in the way we read and think about what God's told us. But he says, Whatever those things uh, that were gained to me, these things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And this is a, a term, like an accounting term, you have pluses and minuses in your ledger book, and all these things were pluses in Paul's old life. He was a Pharisee. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, the, uh, Abraham's father, the nation of Israel. He had done all these things. He was blameless. These are all positives that made him feel like he was righteous. He said, you take that whole list, and it's, it's counted as loss. It's of no value. And actually, the word here that it's worse than useless, rather it is a hindrance. Uh, it's because it's something that has to be unlearned, is really what Paul's saying. It's really a hindrance to him now. He, he can't fall back on the way of thinking. And so, uh, verse 8 says, More than that, I count all things to be lost. Again, uh, the word for count in the Greek, the verb count, is in the present tense. That means it's continuing. So it's been 30 years since Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And in 30 years, he says, I still count. I still count all things as lost. So... Some of the things that Paul lost, no doubt, were family, uh, friends, former associates uh, who'd become strangers to him or even enemies uh, because he had uh, converted and followed Jesus, become a Christian. Uh, we know Paul uh, exchanged the comforts of home to being shipwrecked and being in prison. He... Uh, exchange substantial wealth to uh, for the privilege of working with his own hands to support himself and his team of missionaries. Remember, he was a tent maker. And he, different places, would go and work with his own hands so the people there couldn't accuse him of preaching Jesus for the money. And so he was willing to work to bring more glory to God that way. So he paid a high price. Uh, it's like Matthew 13. Uh, Jesus said that once you find a pearl of great price, that he went and sold all he had and bought it. That's what Paul was. When he met Jesus, he sold everything he had, gave up, counted everything at loss as a loss that was uh, important to him in his former life and gave it up all to follow Jesus. So he finishes this here, he says, In view 
of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. Okay? And in the Greek, the surpassing value is all surpassing greatness. So, just his relationship with Jesus is so surpassing and transcendent and nothing else is worthy to be called good in comparison. Um, there was an ancient writer, uh, Chrysostom, there you go, Chrysostom, and he wrote, When the sun has appeared, it is at loss to sit by a candle. And that was Paul's life. When he met Jesus, it was so much brighter, he did not need this little candle of spirituality that he got from being a Pharisee, okay? Because he had met the sun, and it, his light, just like it shone all about him on the road to Damascus, it continued to shine in Paul, and he had no need for this little candle of his past religious life when he is in the presence of Jesus and following him. So... We're going to stop there for today. What a good lesson that is for us. That we need to only follow Jesus. We need to only be obedient to God's Word and His Spirit leading us through His Word. Then we need to be willing to give up things that we counted as important in the past that maybe we didn't learn correctly or we now know in a better way, in a more full way. So we should be willing to give up the past and only dwell in God's presence, in Jesus' presence now, in that light. So uh, we're going to stop there. We'll start at verse 8 next week. Um, again, uh, look out for one another. Continue to check in on one another. Uh, we know there are, are people from our congregation who are suffering for different health region, reasons. We know there are people that are missing all of us because we can't be together or, and are experiencing loneliness. Um, so let's try to all do our part in making connections and supporting one another. So God bless. Lord willing, I'll see you next week.